Good morning. Today is Saturday the 29th. It's the weekend. It's the weekend. Oof. It's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, Saturday the 29th, and we're going to start with the daily reflection on the New Testament. As they did eat at the Last Supper, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? Matthew 26, verses 21 through 22. It is a tribute to the nobility of the men chosen by the Lord as apostles that they did not sound off in accusatory fashion to confess another man's sins. The temptation was surely great to whisper, I know who it is, it's Judas. He's been acting strange lately. Or, you know, Simon Peter has seemed a bit squeamish during the past few days. I wonder if he's the one. Instead, the word of the master sobered them, leading each of the eleven apostles to engage in serious introspection. Search your hearts, the prophet Joseph Smith implored us, and see if you are like God. I have searched mine, and I feel to repent of all my sins. That's a, a good point and an interesting lesson. One, that they didn't immediately go accusatory, which might uh, be the natural thing to do. Oh, well, they did this and they did this and, oh, it's probably going to be them. But they went inwardly and then also, search your heart. Are you like Jesus? Probably not. I know I could use a lot of work. Okay. So today is Acts chapter 20, and um, in this chapter, Paul goes, he's traveling a bit, but he's going to Jerusalem. He wants to be there on the day of Pentecost. Um, but let's see, where is he at this moment? Troas. They came from Philip, Philippi, Philippi, and they came to Troas, and they stayed seven days. Anyways, he's in uh, an upper room, and there's a lot of people there. They've come to hear him speak, um, come to be with him, and as he's preaching, as he's talking, um, this young man named Eutychus, he falls asleep. He's sitting by a window and he falls asleep and he sinks deep into a sleep and he falls out the window um, out of the third loft. Okay, so technically it's not modern day third floor, but it's high and he dies. But Paul goes down and embraces him and then says, don't worry everybody, he's fine. He's going to be fine. And he raises him from the dead and uh, then... He sails away, and he, um, let's see, he goes to a bunch of different places with some people, and uh, he wants to be in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, and then, let's see, okay, so I believe he's in Ephesus. And he's talking to the disciples there, the followers, the members of the church. And he talks to them about, you know, how they need to stay firm in the gospel. How um, some, what does he say? He says, What does he say? He says that there's going to be deceivers coming in like ravening wolves and they're not going to spare the flock. Um, he says, uh, uh, therefore watch and remember that by this, oh no, 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 that's not it. 
what does he say? He says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you oversee overseers to feed the church of God which hath purchased this his with, with his own blood. Holy cow. Okay. So he's exhorting them to stay strong, to take care of the church because he's not going to come back. He's done in this part. He's not going to come back. He doesn't know where he's going or what's going to happen to him, but he's saying goodbye. And it says that they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. Imagine, if you will, upstairs now. Nice, upstairs now. Um, imagine, if you will, someone bringing you the gospel. Imagine if Elder Holland preached to you for three years or whatever, and then he's like, sorry, I gotta go. I can't see you anymore. I would be devastated. Personally, I would be devastated. But what I picked for my personal statement, because I'm trying to get into the habit, because starting next week, Monday, from then on, we're doing personal statements. I shall, I must, I will. Um, the one I picked is verse 9, where Eutychus falls out of the window and was taken up dead. Um, the Some of the stuff that Paul says to the disciples was really good. And if I was picking my favorite scripture, I probably would have picked one of those. But because I was picking a personal statement, a commitment statement, I chose verse 9 because I, I wrote, I must not fall asleep in the word of the gospel. Um, I, I had this image of, you know, he's sitting there listening to the word and he just kind of falls asleep. Everybody falls asleep. Morning session of general conference when you're on your couch with a blanket all snuggled up and warm and they're just speaking in such lovely tones about lovely things and it's just so peaceful. You could fall asleep. It's so easy to fall asleep. But I took this as um, spiritually falling asleep and dying. I must take heed. I must be diligent in not falling asleep in the world, becoming, what is it? Um, numb to the word um what's it what's a better word what's a better word i don't know a better word but i hope you guys understand what i'm talking about and to why i chose that as my statement for today okay let's see teaching this the saints a divine mandate. One of the major responsibilities of our prophet leaders is teaching and preaching the word of God. They testify of Christ, teach the doctrines and principles of the gospel, and encourage us to live righteously. We too should take seriously our obligations to share the gospel with others and give counsel and encouragement at every opportunity. Paul was a consummate teacher and counselor, full of charity and imbued with the Spirit of the Lord, ever committed to speaking the truth of saving grace and obedience to the Lord's commandments, testifying both to the Jew and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. As such, Paul provides a sterling model for us to follow in learning how to fulfill our callings to teach the gospel with courage and forthrightness to our families, associates, and all students of truth. For I have not shunned, he says, to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Here is a sampling of the wisdom from the mouth or pen of the Apostle Paul, both words of warning as well as words of edification. So then it quotes uh, chapter 20, verses 28 through 29, then verse 35, then Galatians chapter 3, verses 8 through 9, 
then Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 through 29, Galatians chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, verses 22 through 23, and verse 25, and then last of all, Galatians 6, 7 through 10. I'm not going to read these because we're going to get into it later on. Okay, here's a quote from Joseph Smith. When asked how he governed so many people, the prophet Joseph Smith said, I teach them correct principles and they govern themselves. This reminds me of something that happened at work yesterday. Um, so I've hired um, a high school girl. Her name is Frankie. Isn't that so cute? I think that's so cute. Um, and she she's a quiet girl. And I've tried to talk to her here about what her hobbies are, you know, try to get to know her, make her feel welcomed and included because... The first year that I worked at the UPS store, I felt like I couldn't talk to anybody because it was the three guys and they were all on their phones the whole time or, you know, whatever. So uh, I've been trying to talk to her a little bit. And yesterday she comes up to me and she's like, hey, do you want to know some drama? And I was like, yes, I do. And technically, yes, it was gossip. However, I don't know the people involved in the story and she wanted to get something off her chest. So I excused it. So she's telling me about a friend of hers who both of them are not LDS. Um, her friend, her family is devout Catholic, devout, like they come from Peru, I think, and they're Catholic. Um, but she's telling me about how her friend has a boyfriend of like seven months that she met online through like a Roblox an online video game or whatever and he lives in Vegas and they met for the first time he came down or came up if he's from Vegas he came up to see her and he's staying he's 15 she's 17 and he came up to visit her and he's staying at her parents house and stuff happened and it it was her first time and like, Frankie was like, I can't believe she just gave it up on the first night. And she was talking about that. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's so horrible. Like, did they, were they safe? And she's like, no. <laughs> like, she could have anything now. She could be pregnant. You know, we're just going over this thing. Me, the old lady at work, I'm like, well, what about this? And what, that, that, that's a really stupid decision. Like, if you're going to have premarital relations fine okay you're 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 17 you think you know best or whatever fine you know you you're not gonna live by my rules or whatever fine but be smart about it you know and then Frankie was saying that her family just went straight to you're gonna burn in hell that's a sin you've sinned just straight to this religious sinning type thing and I'm like what about the okay, you've done something stupid. We don't need to say it's wrong. It is wrong. But let's go to the aspect of correct decision making. Had they focused more on the consequences of the actions other than burning in hell, the STDs, the pregnancies, that making this decision can change your life forever. You know, instead of being like, oh, it's a sin and you're going to burn in hell type thing. Instead of going that route, teach the correct principle of now you've got a baby. If you have premarital relations, you've got a baby now. That changes the rest of your life. Or you've got an STD now. You've got medical conditions now for the rest of your life. You know, you want. Teaching correct principles, not just the consequences or preaching hellfire and damnation. Anyways, that's what it reminded me of. And you just, you, you just want to take these little kids, right? And you're just like, okay, you want to make dumb decisions. That's fine. That's fine. It's your life. You can, you know, but here are going to be the consequences of your actions. If you're going to make a dumb decision, let's not make the dumbest decision. Okay. You need, you need protection, let's get you some protection, okay? Let's not make, let's not ruin our lives at 17. But anyways, I digress. 
that's the story I have for today. I could read more, but I think I've rambled on long enough. Um, let's see. I don't know. Maybe I should read it. No. <sighs> Maybe just a little bit. Who shall be counselors in the church and kingdom of God? Everyone. We all teach continually through word and deed. It seems to be the design of the Almighty that we should depend upon one another and benefit from mutual assistance, nope, assurances, and the sharing of our spiritual gifts and talents. It is not only from our bishops and other church leaders that we that we receive valuable counsel, but also from the myriad of angels on earth who comprise our circle of friends and fellow citizens with the saints. There are thoughts, but I'm not going to speak them. On one occasion where I was serving the stake presidency, a young man came to me to complain that various leaders in his ward were giving him conflicting advice when he asked them for help on a challenging marital situation. He felt that the Relief Society president had the most valuable counsel to give and was troubled that the bishop hadn't come up with any better solutions himself. I assured him, first of all, that it was the individual's responsibility to consider prayerfully all options and then make the decision based on correct principles. Next, I reminded him that each one of his mentors would look at his situation with a different level of empathy and understanding, viewed from a unique set of personal experiences, and thus diversity of opinion is inevitable. But my main point can best be understood through the following excerpt of the letter I wrote to him a few days later. A bishop is a common judge in Israel, which means that he must decide on matters of serious moral consequence and must issue temple recommends as well as more monitor progress of priesthood brethren as to their advancement. The bishop is also the presiding high priest in the ward and is responsible for receiving the funds con contributed. The bishop is nearly always a loving and concerned man, is frequently a radiant and warm individual, and is typically an effective counselor. He is almost never a single or ultimate font of wisdom for all members of his ward in all matters and at all times. It seems to me that the Lord intended his church to be a community of mutual support and mutual trust. There is a natural tendency for us to look to the leaders for guidance and direction. Surely this is proper. However, the church, if I understand 1 Corinthians 12 and DNC 46 correctly, it is a complete network of resources where even the humblest of the least visible member is of value and worth. In fact, it might be from the most unlikely source that inspiration might flow to one in need not just from the bishop or Relief Society president. The reason that not all have all gifts is, it seems to me, so that we might have a need to depend on one another that all may be profited thereby. Yeah, I can be done with that. Right. that is all for today and that was chapter 20 and tomorrow we do chapter 21 and then there's only one day left in july goodness okay today is july 29th and i'll leave you now with a prayer from a diary of prayer this one is from erasmus Thou who art the true sun of the world, evermore rising and never going down, who by thy most wholesome appearing and sight dost nourish and make joyful all things, as well that are in heaven, as also that are on earth, we beseech thee mercifully and favorably to shine into our hearts, that the night and darkness of sin and the mists of error on every side being driven away, thou brightly shining within our hearts, we may all our lifelong go without any stumbling or offense 
impossible. And may walk as in the daytime, being pure and clean from the works of darkness, and abounding in all good works which thou hast prepared for us to walk in. <sighs> Lots of thoughts today. Lots of thoughts. Okay. We're almost done with week two. Awesome job, everybody. Um, I think that's it. I didn't talk about the challenge, but anybody who's new here, we're doing a New Testament mini challenge before we start Come Follow Me next year. Um, if you want to know about it, description below. All right, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to go enjoy my Saturday. I hope you enjoy it as well. I love you all. Have a great day. Bye.